um, Dean Valerie Ann Johnson. And I'd like to begin with our roll call. Okay, and I see um, Commissioner Denard. Good to see you. <laughs> so um, I'll just, I think what we do is I'll call the name and you'll say present. Okay? Okay. And I will begin with um, Commissioner Bryan. Here. Present. Mr. Phillip. Present. Commissioner Snowden. Present. Commissioner Dixon. Present. Commissioner Riddle. Present. Commissioner Denard. Present. And Commissioner Clark. Present. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Um, right. I'm glad to see everyone here today. Um, our chair is unavoidably out of, out of touch for right now. He's doing fine, but had, a, had to miss this particular um, meeting. We're happy to see um, Commissioner Bracken when he comes back. What I'd like to do before we go any further is to make sure that there are no conflicts of interest. Hearing none, I would like to um, ask for the approval of the minutes. Are there any changes that should be made? And if we have someone move to approve the minutes. I would say for the record that um, Commissioner Bryan pointed out a couple of typos to me um, just, just prior to the meeting starting. I've made note of those and will uh, make corrections accordingly. Thank you so much, um, Parker. And so I need a motion with that information. I make a motion we approve the minutes. Barbara. I'll Smith. second it. Uh, um, David Denar. Great, thank you. It has been moved by um, Barbara Snowden and seconded by David Denard for the approval of the minutes. All those in favor, um, the best way, oh, we have to do roll call. If it is, as I call your name, state with an I. I, um, you say aye. Mary Lynn Bryan? Aye. Susan Phillips? Aye. Barbara Snowden? Aye. Noah Reynolds? Aye. David Denard? Aye. Mayor Clark? Aye. And Sam Dixon? Aye. And Valerie and Johnson? Aye. So it's been approved unanimously um, for the minutes to go forward with the correction as stated earlier. Thank you all. And we are following our agenda as printed. And so I'm going to turn this over to um, Sarah Poop to take us through the next part talking about the um, historic market. Thank you, Jean Johnson. Um, I thought Michelle was on here, but I've lost her image. Is she here? She was having computer problems earlier today. Um, but I can go ahead and, and start, and she can certainly fill in if she rejoins us. Um, so we have before you two proposals coming from state historic sites for placement of plaques on individual sites. And before we cover those very briefly, I would just um, add a note that because of newer um, support groups, new members of groups, um, things like that. We've, we've had the opportunity to remind all of our support groups of the guidance uh, that is surrounding the request for a placement of anything at a state historic site. Um, so nothing would come before you that hasn't been um, fully approved by the department um, and, and meeting all the criteria ahead of time. 
So um, with that said, before you there, like I said, there's two um, requests and Sites has done a great job of giving you all the information that you need in terms of the description, the text, the placement, um, the location and all those sorts of things. Neither one of these required any review by Ramona shop for any archeological or state historic site property um, uh, impact, I will say that. So the first one is at um, House in the Horseshoe. That is a plaque from an Eagle Scout for the completion of his work on um, some butterfly and bee uh, gardens um, next to the visitor center. So they would request a small three by five metal plaque to the right of the visitor center, uh, right above the beds. Um, marking his project and his work um, with the text that was provided to you. And I think there's an overhead shot of what that would, would look like, um, where it's gonna go on the site. Does anybody have any questions about that one? And I should say, um, Dean Johnson, do you wanna vote on these individually or do you wanna vote on them together? Um, I think that since there's like just go ahead and vote on them individually. Just okay. In we have any discussion. And so um, we will vote on the first site at the um, House of the Horseshoe. And again, we do this by roll call. So thank you for your patience. Mary Lynn Bryan. I uh, vote yes. Susan Phillips. Yes. Barbara Snowden? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. We probably oh. need a motion to. to oh. it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Correct. First, uh. jump in the cross with that. I need a motion to approve. Uh, I move that we uh, approve the uh, uh, request. David Denard. Second, Sam Dixon. Thank you. It's been moved by David Denard and properly seconded by Sam Dixon to approve the request. I'm calling for the vote by roll call, starting with Mary Lynn Bryant. Yes. Susan Phillips. Yes. Barbara Snowden. Yes. Noah Reynolds. Yes. David Denard. Yes. Mayor Clark? Yes. Sam Dixon? Yes. And Valerie Ann Johnson? Yes. So it has been unanimously approved to place the plaque at the designated site. And Darren, I keep looking at you, um, Dr. Waters, because I was ready for you to weigh in. And then I said, oh, no, you have a different role. So I wanted to acknowledge that you're here in your new capacity. And thank right. you. Yeah. It seems odd, Dr. Johnson. <laughs> right. okay. You can jump in for a vote. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So we would like to go to the next one, Ms. Clue. Okay, sure. Um, and oh, and Michelle is Michelle's back. back so um, Michelle, yeah, if you me, I had technical issues. How how may I chime in on, on the vote that just happened? Uh, that was for um, House in the Horseshoe. If you want to cover the Fort Dobbs plaque request, that's fine. Or if you want me to, I can do it as well. I'm happy for continuity for you to continue. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, for the for the offer. Sure thing. Um, okay, so the second plaque, as I said, is at Fort Dobbs uh, State Historic Site. This is one that would come from the Friends Group, and it would um, honor the um, major donors who assisted in the fundraising for the reconstruction of the fort. And um, I would note that this plaque placement is, is suggested to be inside. Uh, there is a picture that accompanies that where it would be, so it's not exterior to the to the building. There's a description of it, including that it's bronze and its measurement is 15 by 18, um, you know, be pre-drilled with, with holes for it to be mounted. The value is listed on there as well. And then um, right before the picture, you'll see the text that is included that denotes the donors. So that's what the plaque language would look like. Um, and I'm sure Michelle or I can answer any questions um, if you have anything about that. But again, that's this has been fully vetted by site staff and the department staff, and there's no impact to a historic site or any archeological involvement. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, one, one quick question. I see on the note that it was there, hope that the plaque may be in place prior to the planned October 12th meeting. 
uh, membership event. Is that still possible? I believe we might be able to expedite that, Commissioner Denard. Um, we do have some resources in place that might make that possible. Thank you for that question. Okay. Any other questions? This is Susan Phillips. I move that we approve the installation of the plaque at Fort Dobbs as proposed. This Mrs. is Mary Lynn Mary Bryan. Clark. I uh, second. <laughs> Dual competing second. So I. <laughs> no, no problem. Okay. I heard Mary Lynn Bryan second. Been moved by Susan Phillips and seconded by Mary Lynn Bryan to approve the placement of the plaque at Fort Dobbs. I will call for the roll call. Mary Lynn Bryan? Yes. Susan Phillips? Yes. Barbara Snowden? Yes. Noah Reynolds? Yes. David Denard? Yes. Sam Dixon? Yes. Mayor Clark? Yes. And Valerie Ann Johnson says yes. It has been um, approved. So yay. And thank you both Michelle and um, Sarah for ushering us through this and having some positive news about plaques for today. So at this time, um, I think before we get to our sessions and the sessions, we did have um, a legal update from Phil. Now, um, we, did we do this in closed session, Phil? No, um, okay. I, I, I can I can share the news pretty quickly, and I don't I'm not sure it's if it's even an agenda item, but um, I just wanted to update the commission. Um, as you know, Department of Justice represents the commission in litigation, and um, Karen Blum had been assigned as your attorney for that litigation from uh, the Service to State Agencies section at DOJ. Karen has actually left DOJ. She hasn't gone far. Um, she has actually joined our in-house legal team, um, and so you still may be working with her on other items, but she will no longer be representing the commission mm. um, in the, uh, the Pasquotank County matter regarding their local Confederate monument. Um, and DOJ will be assigning a new attorney to, to represent the commission on that. Um, the, and I'll, I will uh, offer the, the requisite disclaimer and say that I don't represent the commission in that matter. And so this isn't legal advice that we need to go into closed session for. Uh, but just as an update, that Pasquotank County matter was, um, some motions were heard, uh, the matter was stayed until resolution of a Supreme Court case or a case that is pending at the Supreme Court um, regarding a monument in Winston-Salem that the commission is not a party to. Um, and so we are waiting, we're in a holding pattern on that Pasquotank County matter. And the Buncombe County matter regarding the Vance monument, the plaintiff uh, took a voluntary dismissal on that case. And so there's only one active case that the commission is is um, a defendant in. So that's just a, an FYI. And um, after we have a new attorney assigned to the matter or we have litigation updates, we can we can certainly do that in closed session at a future meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much for that update. And now we will move to the a session, the DS session. Okay, um, I will handle those as well. Um, Dr. Waters joined our team on, on the very day that we had our last uh, committee meeting about accessions and deaccessions. So we felt like um, there were many other things that he could be spending his time with um, that were very important. Not that accessions and deaccessions aren't, but um, there will be many more of those to come. So um, I chaired that last, that last meeting and I'm happy to bring these to you. Um, and in discussion with, with Dean Johnson, we'll pause for a vote in between each of the major groups which were identified, um, but I'll run through these fairly quickly. Ken's on the call, Michelle's on the call, if there's more detailed questions about any of these items um, on here, and I'll try to keep them together by, by donor. 
So the Museum of History has a number of accessions, including some face masks, masks for the um, Your Stories North Carolina Story Collecting Initiative that they're doing um, as the archives are, are doing to document the pandemic and pandemic response. Um, there's some 1869 um, Wilmington, Charlotte and Rutherford Railroad bonds and a North Carolina treasurer's letter. Uh, there's some military items from a donor, including a Civil War knapsack, some matches, um, and a uh, victory loan volunteer pin. And, and I should also note, if, I, I hope you all had the opportunity to read through these. They, it goes into detail about why they fit mm -hmm. the collecting you know, um, needs of the museum. So there's more detail in there as well. Um, a baby powder tin with some good North Carolina provenance to it. Um, a donor we all know well, Ken Howard, donated some uh, 2020 ACC tournament tickets. Uh, they're collecting things, <laughs> events that were canceled uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and then a number of items for the Sports Hall of Fame, including several items related to Marty Sheets, a member of the Hall of Fame, an inductee, I should say, to the Hall of Fame, um, and uh, North Carolina a Special Olympics athlete of, of some renown. Um, so many items from, from his uh, uh, time as an athlete, and then some materials related to the um, Duke track and field coach. And these items are related to his service uh, with the a couple of um, Olympic teams, 1984 and 1988. So some materials related to that service. Um, then some addition of some toys, uh, including toys that meet co specific collecting needs, don't have a lot of space age toys or toys related to provenance with uh, females playing with, you know, cowboy and Western toys, so things like that, that were useful to the collection that had, had some gaps. Um, uh, I, I've rarely seen people get too excited about vacuums, but the Kirby vacuum cleaner <laughs> provoked a lot of conversation. They're very excited about that. This is a, apparently a very good condition vacuum and has great provenance. It's related to a very well-known um, um, Kirby distributor and with strong North Carolina and Raleigh ties. So they were excited by that addition as well. Um, and following that, a sewing machine that also can document changing technologies. And there's a lot of good history and provenance and, uh, related to North Carolina with that one. Um, I hope you've had the opportunity to see the Variety Vacation Land exhibit sort of related to that collecting um, initiative, some souvenir pennants. Those are a nice piece to talk about travel and tourism in North Carolina, as well as some pirate jamboree uh, flags. And then moving to their military uh, collecting um, in pieces this time, there's uh, quite a few pieces that are related to the Air Force from a variety of time periods um, that really rec uh, represent gaps in uh, the collection, things that they don't have, uniforms um, that are, are very important in good condition, so related to uh, military history in North Carolina. And let's see, got some other uh, Vietnam era uniform and another World War II army uniform, similarly meeting some, some collecting needs for interpretation. And a series of World War I items related to um, one man service uh, and including some patches and iron knuckles and dog tags and medals. Uh, a more recent set of fatigues from um, the late 2000s from the Marines. And then finally, also inspiring a lot of interest is a, uh, a pot for gathering turpentine. So apparently that's been much sought after. So they were happy to have that to add to the collection. So that's that's the Museum of History sort of overview. Um, and if you have any questions, like, like I said, I'm sure Ken or I could answer them. One quick question. Uh, I, I hope it's appropriate. Uh, 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 Ken uh, donated the uh, uh, 2020 ACC uh, basketball tickets. Uh, is it possible to say what the value of these may be uh, at this point? <laughs> well, since they canceled the rest of the games, I don't guess there's a whole lot of value to them because uh, that was one of the reasons we collected them is since it was one of the big events that got canceled due to COVID. Uh, that's why I, I donated the tickets. But uh, I can't remember exactly, Dr. Denard, exactly what I paid for those tickets, but uh, it was uh, probably several okay. hundred dollars. A resale okay. value of zero, probably. Right. <laughs> okay. I don't think you'll be able to, Dr. Denard, I don't think you'll be able to use them next season. Let me put it that way. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so um, we were going to vote according to that each um, museum collection, and so I need a motion, please. Dr. Johnson, this is Barbara Snowden. I make a motion we accept the sessions list. I will second that, Denard. It has been moved by Brock, Barbara Stoner and seconded by David Denard that we approve the session's list for Museum of History. And now we'll do the roll call. Yeah, I switched up on it. Um, Susan Phillips? Aye. Mary Lynn Bryan? Aye. Barbara Snowden? Aye. Noah Reynolds? Aye. Mayor Clark? Aye. Sam Dixon? Aye. And David Denard? Aye. Valerie Ann Johnson? Aye as well. It's been approved. Okay, and I, I know we all look forward to the days when we can be together and there's not a roll call vote for everything. I apologize. <laughs> I feel like I'm bringing you all the votes, but um, one accession from the Museum of the Albemarle, that's some um, wooden paintings by a local painter, um, hope to be used in an upcoming exhibit on um, recreation in the maritime environment. So that's all from the Museum of the Albemarle. I call it for... Um... A motion, please. Um, Dr. Johnson, if yes. I may. Um, his, historically, um, the uh, commission has uh, chosen to select, collect, to approve all accessions on a single slate. Oh, okay. And all, all D accessions on a single slate. Uh, that won't be the case here since they already voted, since you already voted on the MOH stuff. But if, if I think it is an option if you choose so to just uh, accept the balance of the uh, accession items as a single slate um, to make it a little easier, one, two oh, less votes in this case. Absolutely. Thank you for that, um, for notice, for bringing that to my attention. I appreciate it. And the balance of the accession will be voted as a single slate. So let's move to the next. Sure, okay, I'll move through the rest of them. So from the Maritime Museum system, um, a fishing creel, um, a, a Navy uniform, um, some Queen Anne's Revenge pint glasses, some Coast Guard documentation from a, a local uh, member of the Coast Guard, some waders that also were used um, locally, and a toy boat. Um, that would be used in exhibit from 1935. And then the accessions from historic sites um, are the, I guess, the remainder of our accessions. Um, those include a map of Fort Fisher, um, a cradle for Somerset Place from the 19th century, a buggy jack for historic Edenton, a crib, uh, for historic Halifax. And then there's a number of items from the transportation museums and those are grouped by the donor um, who is, is donating the groups of materials. Um, so some mid 19th century and 20th century um, paper materials, um, some Piedmont Airlines paraphernalia, um, a collection from a railroad machinist for the Southern um, Railway and Spencer Shops itself for 42 years, donated some materials. Um, a, a grouping of some um, other um, railroad materials, including uh, hats and plaques and pictures and pins, some technical drawings from the 1920s, some technical proofs and a safety plaque from um, the Hain Car Shop um, in South Carolina, some railroad timetables, and I believe the last collection on there is a, a group of materials that's being transferred from the Norfolk Southern archives that are more directly related to Norfolk Southern and to Spencer Shop. So these are materials that are coming from their collections and their archivists who felt like they were a better fit for the Transportation Museum. So that is the end of all their accessions. I think that's it for accessions. Yep, that's it. Okay, so we're going to 
Okay, thank you so much, um, Sarah. That was a kind of whirlwind, but I um, we appreciate it. So now I can more properly ask for a motion on these accessions. I move approval, Mrs. Mary Lynn. I move approval of all the accessions. This is Susan Phillips, I second. So it's been moved by Mary Lynn Bryant and seconded by Susan Phillips to approve all of the sessions. And here we go with the roll call. Mary Lynn Bryant. Yes. Susan Phillips. Yes. Barbara Snowden. Yes. Noah Reynolds. Yes. Mayor Clark. Yes. David Denard. Yes. Sam Dixon. You may have had to leave us for a bit. And um, Valerie Ann Johnson. So we still maintain four, so it passed. It, we have approved the session. All right, um, fewer D accessions, and I'll, and again, they're kind of grouped together. There's many items, but related from one donor. Um, so a lot of these represent uh, uniforms that maybe don't have any real North Carolina provenance, um, would be better suited at another institution, and we have better examples of, of the same time period. So the first one from the Museum of History being a Spanish-American War vintage uniform that would be sent to the Texas Heritage Museum um, in Hillsborough, Texas. So all the items related to that uniform um, as well as a World War II uh, Marine Corps uh, uniform that um, we would recommend send to the MacArthur Memorial in Norfolk. Again, not a um, not it living in North Carolina during his service period. So there's there's better examples with connections to North Carolina that we could we could retain. And then from the Maritime Museum, there's um, a series of postcards that have been identified as um, either duplicates or not really exactly related to what they're gonna be interpreting or, or putting on display. So they're recommending that all these postcards be offered to a local museum um, for, an, for another repository. Um, they, they also have a US Navy jacket from World War II. Um, they have two better uniforms from the same time period that are more complete and better shape. This one is in very poor condition. So if there is not another museum that wants it, they would recommend disposal of the uniform. Um, and the same would hold true for some uh, Coast Guard uniform items that would be offered to another museum. And if no one wanted it, they would be disposed of. They are also in, in fairly poor condition. And the last thing from the Maritime Museums for deaccessions was a chronometer. Um, they have similar ones already in the collection and in better shape. So this one would also be offered to another museum. And the last one is a little bit of a puzzlement. It was a wooden boat. They think it's a wooden boat fragment. Um, it does not uh, really have much interpretive value, no, not a real context. Um, so this one, if nobody, no other museum was interested in it, it would be disposed of as well. And then historic sites has identified three things from historic Stagville that were badly damaged in the 2020 fire, unfortunately, and really cannot be salvaged um, in, in any way. So those items would be deaccessioned and they include a table, a painting and a chair. And, and you know, insurance claims are, we could, couldn't even be conserved. So there's really nothing that can be salvaged. And that's the deaccessions. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Again, just for a matter of protocol, the commission may recall that uh, typically votes on deaccession items are handled separately for the recommendation of the item and then the method of disposal. Um, if, if we want to continue that practice or if you want to continue that practice, um, you could vote you know, just I would suggest maybe making two votes, uh, vote to accept uh, recommendations for deaccessions, then vote to accept uh, recommendations for method of disposal. And, and I'll just say there's nothing really requiring that. So if if you want to save the roll calls, it would be OK to Correct. to accept both as one motion. And Correct. Thank you. OK, let's let us do the last and that's accept the both motions for the roll call. 
so that um, one, let's see. Uh, one question before we uh, uh, yeah. proceed. Uh, uh, the language here, for example, uh, we have uh, one uh, item here for DIA sessions, uh, the uh, uh, Mrs. Wallace, uh, the object is a collection of five U.S. Army uniforms, and uh, these are the, to be sent to Texas, to the Texas Heritage Museum. Now, when you say send, uh, Sarah, uh, to the uh, museum, does that mean that they have already agreed to accept the item? I believe it does. Because yeah, the yes. item you have, you, you okay. have we'll, we'll just send, uh, we recommend uh, that, uh, 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 that something be sent uh, to a particular place. Yes, if we recommend a specific uh, location, Dr. Denard, to send something to, we have already spoken to them to see if they are interested in having it. Uh, okay. If they are interested in having it, then that's how we form our recommendation for this position. Okay. 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 That, uh, uh, that clarifies that for me, because in this, uh, uh, in this uh, item on uh, uh, World War II USM dress blue coat, uh, you say recommend transfer to the MacArthur Memorial in Norfolk, Virginia. You recommend uh, that, but on the uh, piece uh, uh, earlier, you said we will send it to Texas. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay, just wording, okay. but we, yeah. again, you, you, you have to approve what we recommend. And so while we're recommending it, you may say, no, I want to do something else with it. I'd like for East Carolina to have it, for instance, or something like that. So, uh, yes, we, we recommend, actually, our military curator, his previous job was at the MacArthur Museum, so he has spoken to them, and they are interested in having it if, if you approve the recommendation. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. So, is everyone real clear? I can give an example of how this um, motion could go if we would like it. Um, as I understand it, we can say something to the lines of we accept the recommendation from the staff for decessioning um, the museum, uh, the items presented, and we accept the recommendation for their disposal. Would that be sufficient, Mr. Fagan? This is Mayor Clark. I'll, I'll make that motion that we accept the recommendations for the decommissions as well as the method of disposal. And if, if there's no dispute or, or concern about the methods or or, um, or the actual disposal, then I think it's fine to have a compound motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And I will, I will second that if uh, Denari. And Denari has seconded. If there are no questions or comments, I will call for the vote. Beginning with Mary Lynn Bryan. Yes. Susan Phillips. Yes. Barbara Snowden. Yes. Noah Reynolds. Yes. Mayor Clark. Yes. David Denard. Yes. Sam Dixon. And Valerie Ann Johnson says yes. So we have approved the reassessioning and the um, method for disposal of the items presented today. Thank you all. So at this point, we are ready for our division report. And moving along quite nicely. And I'm going to start in the order that I see my screen here. And we will end with some remarks by you, um, Dr. Waters, OK? So I'm going to begin with um, Ken Howard. Hey, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, hopefully, you all had a chance to look over our report. It's been a, uh, since our last meeting, things are picking back up. 
uh, with our visitorship. Uh, the Museum of History was up to 23,000 visitors during the month of July. And we dropped off a little bit at 16,000 or so in August. But again, I think the school, school, school has started back up. But we have two new additions to our museum staff. Maria Van is our new deputy director of the museum. That position has been open for two years. We're very fortunate to get Maria. She has spent several years in New York. She was previously the director of the East Hampton uh, Historical Society on Long Island. They had several historic homes as well as a couple of museums that she was in charge of. Before that, she'd been at the Iroquois Museum in New York and the uh, Battleship Discovery Code Museum up at, uh, in Massachusetts. So we've got uh, some great experience. We're very fortunate to have her working with us here. Uh, she oversees our curation staff, our collection staff, editors and graphics, and our education staff. In addition, we've had uh, Dan Block join our museum as the director of uh, exhibitions. This is a new position we created uh, because we are gonna be working a lot on redoing every single exhibition in the renovation of the museum. We felt we needed somebody who could come in and really take charge of that exhibition development program. Uh, Dan's great, has some great, great experience. He um, spent over 20 years at the Minnesota Historical Society, which is well known for a lot of the exhibits that they produced, in, including some very large traveling exhibits that went around. Um, another uh, claim to fame of Dan is his grandfather was Dr. Benjamin Spock. So um, <laughs> glad, to have him here. glad to have him here at the museum. Uh, again, he brings a, a lot of experience uh, to the museum. Uh, new exhibits here, if you get a chance to come over, we opened our answering call exhibit on North Carolina's military history from the Spanish-American War up through World War II, opened back in April. Uh, Variety Vacation Land that Sarah mentioned uh, opened also shortly after that. Uh, we have just opened our exhibit on Black Beer and the Queen Anne's Revenge. This is a traveling exhibit that the Maritime Museum had developed a while back. It's been down at the Graveyard Atlantic Museum, and we have borrowed it for the fall and spring before we return it back to them. And the big exhibit we have coming, for those of you who may be Downton Abbey fans, is we have a, an exhibit called Dressing the Abbey. It's a collection of 35 costumes from the TV show and the movie. Uh, that will be on display here starting on October the 23rd and run through January the 17th. We're grateful to the department. The department uh, found some funding to help us uh, acquire this exhibit. It was not an inexpensive exhibit to acquire, but we really think uh, now that the museum is back open, this will be a great exhibit to attract uh, people back to the museum. Of course, we did lots and lots of uh, programs, lots and lots of uh, online programs. Uh, we were uh, glad to participate with the Juneteenth celebration in uh, June and did a, uh, a program on Juneteenth, the history of Juneteenth and a Zoom program and had over 400 people attend that presentation. So we're glad about that. And we also did a presentation from the White House Historical Society all about building the White House. And that was very interesting. Um, our other museums, uh, Museum of the Cape Fear, their big thing this summer was they had a de dedication of the History Village Education Center uh, that the um, uh, Civil War and Reconstruction Center has put together. It's a great facility and we're looking forward to using that facility as we move forward. Uh, the Graveyard Atlantic, uh, assuming that they get approval in the budget, assuming the budget passes, there's money in the budget for them to finally do their permanent exhibit on the Graveyard Atlantic. Uh, the plans have been drawn for a couple of years now and we've just been waiting for funding and that funding is finally in the budget uh, from not only the governor, but both, both the House and the Senate have it in their budget. Uh, from attendance-wise, ironically, uh, the Maritime Museums have done great. Uh, the Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum has over 106,000 visitors since they reopened back September a year ago. And the Beaufort Museum has over 104,000 visitors that they've seen since reopening a, uh, a year ago. So we're glad for that. The Beaufort Museum also got a $99,000 grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences to expand uh, they have an on-site conservation center where we've been doing uh, conserving small artifacts from the Queen Anne's Revenge and showing visitors how that is done. Uh, so we've gotten uh, this $99,000 grant to expand that uh, lab to allow us to start conserving some larger artifacts and also to add an intern to help us out. Uh, the Southport Museum uh, continues to have a, a great run too. They just received the Golden Pineapple Award uh, for excellent cu customer service from the uh, Southport Oak Island Chamber of Commerce. So all our museum, museums doing great. Uh, Mountain Gateway has still been continuing to sponsor the farmer's market all through the summer. Um, and so like I can say everything is going great with our museums and we appreciate 
all the support that you give us and please come check out our exhibits. Thank you so much, um, Kim. And also I have to say there, it is real busy um, over there, both in and outside of the museum. And I do also appreciate your curatorial staff. They've got an idea for another upcoming exhibit on um, North Carolina A to Z that'll be very inclusive and talk about um, communities with disabled, LGBTQ, and all kinds of things. So the museum is kind of popular. So I, I'm appreciative of the work that is being done there. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. We appreciate it. Now, I will, I'm going kind of in my order. So, and I apologize for not going in the order that's. Um, that you send it to us, but it's kind of easier for me to keep track of you as I see you. So Sarah, <laughs> you're up next. Sure thing, thank you. Um, and uh, before I, I highlight a few things from my report, um, I think I would like to also just say, I really want to extend my appreciation to Michelle and Ramona and Ken for all their collegiality and their cooperation um, when I was the acting deputy secretary, um, I would just really like to raise to you all that the department and specifically within the Office of Archives and History, we have a great team of folks that just really are dedicated to what we do. And I think I have an even greater appreciation for what all of their units and their staff are working on. And it was really a lot of fun to work more closely with them and, and get a better understanding of some of their their day to day work. So. Um, rest assured that this is an amazing group of folks that really love what they do and, and bring it every day for the department. So I do appreciate their cooperation. And um, I just wanted to share that for the public record. Um, so a little bit about what's been going on uh, in the archives. Of course, you can read more about this in my report. Um, starting kind of where Ken started, we're getting back to more normal hours. Um, in a couple of weeks, we'll be Monday through Friday full time, and then I'm anticipating that we will return to our Tuesday through Saturday schedule in November um, as, as the department is, is back to uh, fully staffed, and that can mean also that folks are teleworking too, but we're back to kind of our full capacity. Um, we want to get back to doing our Saturday hour, so we, we will be looking forward to doing that. Um, a little bit about outreach programming. I highlighted some specific programs, but what we've tried to do this year is do at least a monthly um, program, uh, usually in the evening. So watch for those. They're a lot of fun. I highlighted several that we've already done in, in collaboration with other folks, including Ken's staff. Um, but coming up, we've got um, a uh, spooky stories program in October, as well as we're doing quarterly North Carolina trivia nights with the state library. The last one was quite competitive. I was very surprised um, when I joined that one. So that's been a lot of fun. And um, we're partnering with the Office of State Archaeology, hopefully in November, on November 1st, All Saints Day, for a Friends of the Archives program on cemeteries and, and cemetery preservation and, and things like that. So we hope that'll be a, a popular topic. Um, we have tried to do as much digitization as possible while we've been you know, working uh, part-time in the building and part-time out of the building. Um, so recent collections added have included uh, the Good Neighbor Council materials. I was excited by that. That was one of the first collections I worked as a student. So that's an initiative of Terry Sanford to start dealing um, with some issues that were coming up in the 60s. And he was wanting good neighbor councils to be formed in every single county. So some of those selected materials have been digitized. Nice compliment to the Council of Women Records, which were also added this year, some selections from that. Um, so those are some, some of our highlights of our recent uh, digital collection additions. Um, in our oral history area, I'm very excited by the work of our oral historian who started in December. He's just really going gangbusters on what he's been working on, including uh, working very closely with our government records staff to do a COVID oral history program specifically aimed at state agencies and boards and commissions. We really felt like that was an area that was not documented by anybody else. That's really our job. So already in the last couple months, they have secured um, interviews from 12 different agencies. That includes uh, Supreme Court, it includes the Commissioner of Banks, several state agencies, and um, then that's 23 interviews with, with at least five more scheduled in the next couple of weeks. Those five are actually gonna be a little more in-depth look at DHHS and their work in collaboration with um, other public health officials on the pandemic response. So we hope to continue doing that and make some connections that we can continue. I, I think we sort of anticipated when we started, we might be wrapping this program up, but COVID seems to continue on and on. So we can 
follow back up with people as the pandemic continues to evolve and, and get their um, take on how they adapted their state agency work to the pandemic. Um, our military historian has been partnering with the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, as has Ken, on a grant uh, from the Humanities Council promoting military history uh, preservation in North Carolina. And um, our archivist role is he's taken some blog posts that he wrote for our Stories of Service blog, turned those into nominations for the North Carolina Hall of First um, military history focused. And then we're gonna work on creating um, publications with the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs um, to hopefully promote that Hall of First and promote the preservation of North Carolina military history um, in the state. Um, our Transcribe NC platform, which is a place where um, volunteers can come in and help us transcribe documents to create much better access. People love it when you can go straight down to a word as opposed to normally we just kind of catalog to the document level. Um, that has just really been going very well during the pandemic. Um, we have 10 active collections in there, constantly going to be adding new ones. We've been working with the software developers to uh, and other, some other state archives to expand the capacity of that program so we can add different types of materials that previously have been difficult to transcribe. So I'm very excited that hopefully we should be able to add um, list and ledger formats. And that may sound like it's a very um, small thing to think about, but when you think about the archives, we have a lot of ledgers and a lot of lists. And so uh, transcribing a letter is fairly easy. You just start at the beginning and go to the end, but um, ledgers are fairly complicated. So that's taken some software engineering. One of the first collections that I have in mind to then offer for crowdsource transcription would be the 1903 voter registration rolls that are commonly known as the grandfather clause books. Um, great historical resource and genealogical resource. So I'm hoping that, that that will be added to Transcribe NC soon, but we've really had a lot of good attention from that site. Um, other highlights uh, include, we've been you know, just doing a lot of work on national advocacy for funding for humanities and archives, um, kind of a moving target. As you know, the federal government you, you get settled, you think they're going to do something, and then they do something else. So we're, we're hoping to start advocating on a national level across archives and humanities groups for some um, a block funding grant program for archives across the country that probably be funneled to the states to go to local repositories to help with the preservation and access to documentary materials. Um, there'll be a long haul, I'm sure, but I just wanted to Put that out there because we're we're hoping to get started and and lay some groundwork and make some deeper connections. We've been working with the American Library Association, National Humanities um, Alliance, and the National Coalition for History to start thinking about what that would look like and who some of our our partners and champions would be for that kind of a national effort. And America 250 it feels like that's a good time to really highlight um, the importance of preservation of documentary heritage across the country. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. Um, and like I said, more details in the report, but that's a little bit about what we've been up to in the last six months. Yeah, not, not, not so much, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. And we'll, there's a um, comment that I'll make at the end during my remarks. Um, I'd like to move now to, unless anyone has any questions for um, Sarah about anything, that they've read and noted in the report. If not, I'd like to I'll move to Ramona Bartos. Thank you very much, Dean Johnson, and good afternoon to everyone. It's really great to see you all and uh, very excited to, to give our report and to also welcome Dr. Waters, who, uh, as part of his broad portfolio, also joins us as the uh, new State Historic Preservation Officer. So. Uh, so he has a special role with our division in that, uh, with that federal responsibility. Um, I have a longer report that I've submitted prior to the meeting, but I just want to give you some highlights, especially for the public. Um, many people come to our, 
our division and make a career of their work. We're all very mission focused and um, really love working with the public. And uh, during the, the pandemic, we actually had several people retire after. And I, I think if you combine all of their, their time, it's, it's like 75, 80 years worth of experience that, um, that we've had. So both Scott Power, who had been here for almost 30 years, who is the supervisor of our regional office in Greenville, uh, retired. Um, and then also David Christenberry, who actually, uh, as an architect, had started his career working on designing the North Carolina Zoo, ironically enough, but he was one of our preservation architects working with the Residential Historic Tax Credit Program. So they both retired. Uh, and then Annie McDonald, who uh, many of you know uh, out of our Asheville office, uh, hard to forget Annie, she's a, a very engaging lady, uh, very, very publicly oriented. Um, she has left to, to uh, have a new chapter of her career in the private sector working with consultants. So that's good for us because we'll continue to benefit from Annie's hard work and mm -hmm. preservation as well. So that that fills that's a bit of a, a hole in our office in the historic preservation office. So uh, we are taking steps to fill those those positions right now. Um, for those of you from uh, Western North Carolina, uh, you do know that we do have uh, unwelcome visitors in the sense of tropical storms and hurricanes. And we had one of those uh, a couple of weeks ago with Tropical Storm Fred, which unfortunately visited the Western office as well and flooded the basement because we had, um, we had an electrical outage in the area in that part of Asheville, as well as many parts of, of Western North Carolina. Um, it, relatively speaking, compared to some of the loss of life and so forth that we saw, um, it wasn't that big of a deal, but we did have to have some some help with that. And um, that's never a good thing, particularly in a building where we have archives, as Sarah can tell you. So um, sump pump's not working. That's not a good thing. It's just a cautionary tale that the kinds of things that we need to think about for our agency is also affecting the public and that Western North Carolina, sadly, is not immune to some of these, these storms that, that um, such as Commissioner Snowden is very familiar with over on the east side of, of the state. So we've got to continue to think about that and how we can help all of our, our resources survive um, those kinds of events. I also wanted to uh, just report, we now really, the Western office really has become the, the hub for the agency. There's almost 20 people working in the Western office right now. And that's really cuts across all of our, our different program areas, not just archives and history, but we have some of our colleagues from the parks and scientific areas of our agency working there. So if you haven't stopped by uh, recently, I, I encourage you to do that. They'll be very glad to see you. Um, the highway marker program has gone, as you know, from our, my previous reports into a bit of a hiatus. We are waiting uh, with, with great ba bated breath on what the budget might, uh, might bring us. We hear that there's some positive support to increase the dollars that are coming to us. And I really wanna thank management in the last couple of months identified some funds to help us uh, with some of our backlog. And so one of those uh, markers that has gone up, we ordered it and put it up, was for Rafael Guastafino. Uh, Mr. Guastafino, you might know, is a very noted architect and engineer of sorts, who was a Spanish immigrant that came through Ellis Island and uh, settled in Black Mountain. I think the, the Biltmore project largely brought him to the Asheville area, but if you go throughout the eastern, especially the eastern part of the country, you will see his tile work in many, many public buildings, um, both in North Carolina, as well as far flung up to New York and Boston. And um, it's really extraordinary stuff. So if you'd like to know more about Guastafino, I'm very glad to share that, but we're glad to have, have him recognized as a North Carolinian uh, of great note. Um, the Historic Research Office is also working. Uh, Sarah has been uh, doing a magnificent job leading our efforts to start the America 250 commemoration work. Um, and that, is, um, that has been a, a really, uh, wonderful opportunity for all of us to come together as a team throughout the Office of Archives and History and also working again through cross divisionally elsewhere in our department. The parks folks, for example, have been uh, part of that as well. But just again, hats off to Sarah. She, she's very modest and did not mention all her hard work in the last couple of months getting all of that uh, off to a running start as well. Um, 
We've also, I, I've reported on this before, but I gave you a link this time just so everyone knows. This is part of what I call COVID Lemons Make Lemonade. Uh, the virtual outreach um, of our department has really been, I think, outstanding and our division has embraced that as well. And we have sort of a podcasty sort of thing uh, that has, it starts out as a Facebook Live experience, but then it ends up on our YouTube channel. So what we're trying to do is highlight uh, through interviews, um, a lot of the different authors that come to us either through our manuscripts programs or either through the North Carolina Historical Review. And they're, they're quite varied. So um, if that's something that you'd like to listen to in a nice, quiet, rainy Saturday afternoon, I invite you to do so. I've, I've enjoyed very much uh, listening to them myself. Along with that, Submerged North Carolina, which you've heard about before, um, it's, we, turned, we turned Archaeology Month, which is typically in October, into a year-long year movable feast. We've had over 5,000 people in 50 countries tune in to Submerge North Carolina, which is all about the underwater archaeology heritage of the state. So again, those are also available. Uh, we've done that in cooperation with NOAA, which has been really great. Uh, this week, and I think they have finished for the day because it's been raining in the greater metropolitan Raleigh area, but we have been doing some uh, ground penetrating radar activities sort of in the backyard, so to speak, of 109 East Jones Street. I think even Dr. Waters went out there and and uh, was able to, to put, put, his, put his back behind uh, the machinery, which it's really like pushing a, a cart in a grocery store a little bit or a stroller. It's, it's not super hard, but it's you gotta, gotta keep it straight. Uh, and that is to help us find where the remains of the previous residents and supporting buildings uh, for what was, what was there before our building was there. And when our, our building was built in the 1960s, there were no laws to mandate any kind of checking anything out. And that's in preparation for Freedom Park being built. Uh, our belief is, and this is part of what we're trying to ground truth, our belief is that uh, the <clears throat> people who lived on our block included enslaved individuals associated with the, the Hogg family. We, we were gonna find out more about that, um, but it's we have a lot of information that has aided us in trying to, to figure that out. So I hope to have some more information um, to bring to you at the next meeting about that. And uh, it's been a great opportunity too for people to see how this technology works. And it's, it's exciting just to go out the back door and, and do that kind of work as well. Uh, and finally, um, I just wanna mention, we've had a good bit of national register interest as always, but I wanna highlight in the last meeting in June, we had approximately uh, 11 properties or districts go through and about 40% of those had uh, an African-American focus, including South Asheville Cemetery and St. John A. Baptist Church, uh, the John and Smith Cemetery in Southport, uh, the Graves Fields House in Raleigh, which was uh, built by members of the Oberlin community. Um, and then also the St. Stephen's United Methodist Church, which Mayor Clark, I think you probably know this particular property is in Lexington. So we are very glad to see that. It's a really great uh, geographic distribution of all of these nominations. So again, we continue to encourage all of you commission members, you hear about constituents interested in our programs, please do send them our way. We're, we're very glad to help them. I also want to report, um, I have been, I think I mentioned this at the last meeting, I, I was honored to be elected as the board president of the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers. And at that same meeting where I was elected, um, we, we, I'm sorry, someone was trying to call me. We decided that we, we wanted to embark on a study, a reflection, an investigation, if you will, of various um, national designation programs to see if there, um, if there were some things that could be tweaked, if there were some things that could be elaborated upon, if there were some more constituent services that we could offer um, as state historic preservation offices throughout the country, along with the National Park Service. Um, so that, that work is ongoing. There's a working group with subcommittees, and we've been, among other things, um, interviewing some of our colleagues. Um, we're also, we've also been reviewing a lot of the literature around these programs because a lot of people really are very interested in the National Register, but it seems very daunting. It seems very complicated. And we really, again, being very constituent service oriented, we, we want to see if, if there's some things that we can improve upon. So 
um, we hope next spring to have something uh, with our group in regards to that project. Um, I'll leave, leave with you. Um, we also have a new certified local government in uh, moving through the process in Alexander County, which has been one of our um, least active counties. We've been working with them on an architectural survey. And the final thing I, I recommend to you is to go check out our local government training, um, which is available on YouTube as well. We included disaster preparedness for this time. So I think we're going to continue to do that. And we're sort of building HPO TV little by little. So I appreciate everyone's support and interest in our programs. Glad to answer any questions you might have. Uh, a couple questions for you, uh, uh, Ramona. Yes, sir. Uh, one, pertain, uh, one pertains to the, uh, 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 the archaeological uh, investigations that you will yes, be sir. conducting. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, do you have a, a plan B in the event that something should be uncovered there? That, that would prevent the normal uh, flow of developments in terms of doing the construction that you uh, want to do. Uh, because sometimes we do unearth, you know, graves and, 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 and there's possibility that some enslaved barrier remains may be there, you know. Uh, so uh, have you considered that? That's, uh, 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 that's what I wanted to uh, call to your attention. Yes, sir. We don't have any evidence at this point that there are any burials of any kind on, on the property, Dr. Nenard, um, but there are the laws that deal with, with grave protection, and we will, we will certainly be uh, looking at all of the data that we're collecting now to see. You, you, can, you can oftentimes tell if an anomaly is something along those lines. What we're really expecting to find are outlines of buildings, uh, cellar, um, there's a couple of buildings we suspect had a cellar or some kind of summer kitchen kind of um, cold kitchen sort of thing, or um, certainly a cistern, I think, is also what we expect to find back there. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think we were expecting to find anything of, of that level of concern, but uh, we do plan on uh, for anything that, that might be encountered to just have a monitor on standby, but um, we don't... We don't anticipate anything that would be of, of that category, but we are certainly uh, looking for anything that is unusual. But we okay. have no expectation of we have no expectation of impacting the, the timeline for Freedom Park. We're all very excited to get it underway. OK, and one other piece. Uh, I serve on the uh, 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 I guess it is the uh, National Register Committee. Yes, uh, and you uh, listed properties that were uh, uh, that were nominated or that were were handled. And uh, last couple of days, uh, I have been talking with uh, a person from Innsfield, Enfield rather, Enfield, uh, North yes, Carolina, and we had the Enfield Historic uh, District, uh, which was approved. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, this person, what? This yeah, person yes, sir, uh, sent me. Oh, oh, okay, and and Scott Power was the one that made that presentation, and he just mm -hmm. retired. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I can no longer have any interaction with him. But uh, I got a, a a call and a letter uh, from a a native of of that uh, community, uh, Willa. Cofield, and she was uh, livid that uh, there were no, uh, uh, there weren't any uh, African American uh, properties in that uh, historic district. I asked the question when we had the meeting uh, if there were any such properties in that district, and the answer was no. And she obviously was was uh, uh, listening to our meeting. Uh, and she contacted me later and then uh, sent me a long list, a broad history uh, of the developments in Enfield. In and I sent that information along to Jennifer, who is the chair of the committee, Jennifer Bros, and, yes. and asked her to uh, share that. Uh, to share that with, uh, with Scott Powell. I didn't know at the time that he had retired, but I'm learning that he had, he had retired. So 
Uh, you indicated in your uh, report, I think that 80% of these properties, uh, 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 national uh, register properties uh, included uh, uh, African-Americans and all of that. And I just wanted to, to share that with you. Uh, Jennifer indicated that she would, would share this uh, letter. I forwarded the letter to her from uh, uh, this Cofield uh, uh, native. Uh, and she's quite a uh, quite a person. Uh, she uh, uh, in that letter, there's a broad overview of the history of Enfield. She was there for about thirty five or thirty six years before she moved away uh, to uh, New Jersey. And okay. she's also something of a filmmaker. Uh, so uh, I just thought I would, uh, you know, uh, make you aware of that. Uh, uh, something else may be, uh, uh, I don't know if any adjustments are possible uh, in that uh, uh, historic district, uh, but uh, I, I think in light of what she said that we may need to go back and revisit uh, yes, sir. Uh, 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 that, that place. Yes, sir. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll be very glad to discuss this with her. And um, I was not aware of that letter. Uh, we have been backfilling Scott's position. John Wood, who's also based in our Eastern office, has been backfilling it. But we'll be sure to, to get back in touch with her. I don't think it was mentioned at the meeting, though, after the National Register meeting. Uh, and, and you're correct, Dr. Denar, we did discuss this. I believe the demographics have also changed to sort of... Um, in, in my mind, a, a chapter of Enfield's history is also being contemplated here. I believe it is over nine, almost 90% African-American at this point. So, um, you know, I guess the distinction is historically African-American versus the community as it, as it is now. So I, I think that's a very interesting aspect to the community's history as it, as it continues to evolve as well. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry for... Uh, adding to the uh, length of your report. <laughs> no, not at all. Glad to answer the question, sir. So we appreciate that um, interjection, and that's what part of the report for us to be able to give guidance and yes. report yes, being done. So thank you, uh, Dr. Janar. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Ramona, and I'm thank you to move to Michelle Lanier now and have her give her report. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, Commissioner Johnson. Um, please forgive me again for not um, being able to make use of my webcam. I am just this evening, I think, picking up a, a new laptop. So um, we're glad to be able to uh, retire this one soon. Um, I do want to also thank you for your support of the um, plaque uh, recommendations that came before you at the um, beginning of this meeting. Um, I'm hoping the approach was a little bit more streamlined for you. We worked really hard behind the scenes to make sure it was a, a little bit more of a streamlined um, interaction. I also have just a small um, verbal errata that I want to acknowledge in the um, document that you received uh, in preparation for today's meeting. There was mention um, of a partnership between uh, North Carolina A&T State University and North Carolina State University working on a community development concept um, related to looking at the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum as an anchoring institution. And what I failed to include um, in, that, uh, in that particular bullet point was the, the town, the important town, name of the town that uh, Dr. the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum anchors, which is the historically black Sedalia North Carolina um, in Guilford County. So I wanted to make that verbal correction for you all. I wanna share um, two stories um, before I uh, kind of give you a more a summary of what you've already received. Um, I had a chance to hear from uh, several individuals who um, call Wayne County and Goldsboro particularly home. Um, and they are also in a strong relationship with some folks in Johnston County. And they are grappling with the legacy of Governor Charles B. Acock, and particularly not just around the birthplace, which is a historic site, but also a high school that's there in Goldsboro. And, and 
some um, tension around that high school having bearing the name ACOC. I had a chance to hear from um, several folks who had been thinking through some of these conversations and was able to um, point them to ACOC birthplace as a resource for those conversations, um, as a place that could be um, a space of gathering, of discussion, a round table, a place where I think some of them had perhaps felt repelled um, and, and not attracted to, to visit um, for various, I think, understandable reasons or, or regarding the racial ideologies of Governor Aycock. And I was able to speak to this predominantly African-American community group and say, I will meet you at Aycock birthplace and let's think about what is already here, what stories we are already telling um, about, um, about Aycock's uh, ideologies and philosophies and what stories have yet been told. And with, with some thoughtfulness, some were uncomfortable at first and, and some realized, wait a minute, through the discussion, they came to an awareness, um, particularly one woman who was a part of the desegregation of a high school, uh, an experience that was um, violent. She said, I now see based on this discussion that that historic site can be a repository for my stories as well, my stories of, of, of this place. And so tomorrow morning, I will be meeting these folks, some of, of whom probably haven't stepped foot on the site in decades, some of whom have maybe never stepped foot on the site. And we're gonna meet, we're going to connect, we're gonna think about the possibilities of truth telling with a community responsive um, uh, ethic and, and value. Um, I'm so proud of the staff there who for the second year in a row will be commemorating the Wilmington 1898 massacre and coup with a film showing of Wilmington on fire and a discussion with the director. I'm also proud that several staff members have also worked together across sites. One staff person from Fort Fisher helping, helping a, a staff person at ACOC to uncover the names of enslaved and indentured African-American laborers who are connected to the ACOC family. So as we are reaching out to respond to the needs of our community uh, constituents who are, are allowing us to create new and, and more inclusive ways of telling stories. That's also inspired our staff to dig deeper into the archive and to illuminate these names that have been hidden um, and that have been silent. So I wanted to start with that story because never did I think that we would see such a day where I would be able to bring a group of African-American elders from Goldsboro um, with a sense of passion and connection to the ACOT birthplace. And this is a part of the work that we're doing right now. I also wanna share um, another story um, and I'll just read from uh, Eastern Regional Director, Jeff Bockert, who has long been with the department and the division shared this with me. He says, when the site manager of the CSS News heard that the Kinston Community Health Center was in need of a place to conduct their drive-through COVID-19 testing facility, he offered them the use of the parking lot behind the CSS News Civil War Interpretive Center in downtown Kinston, quoting, the location is central and the Kinston Community Health Center needed a place to conduct testing three times a week. We have an empty parking lot that we only use for big special events. So I immediately thought they could use it. And so I wanted to share that we are moving into this idea of a community anchor approach for our historic sites, particularly our sites that are in um, communities that need support um, with a, a multitude of things, including COVID-19, um, response as, as well as I think all of you know, we've also made our um, spaces available for um, access to Wi-Fi. Um, I will also share that I just recently did an analysis um, for 2020 around um, how we were able to access funding through grants in particular. And I was able to see that last year, we were able to leverage over $2.5 million in funding from state, federal, and private foundation grant programs to conserve land, including battlefields, 
restore structures, increase staff development and training opportunities, and to grow a more diverse narrative of, of our history. Um, some of the initiatives that we've done, you've been hearing about true inclusion, which continues to grow and develop. We uh, launched a digital engagement team, which um, um, did amazing work dispatching all kinds of technologies across the state. And, and we now have two um, licensed and certified drone operators as a result of some of this funding. And then of course, we were able to partner with the Lumbee tribe to uh, create and program around a, an exhibit, which is on display at Fort Fisher right now called A Memory a people could not forget Lumbee Indians at Fort Fisher. Um, we, we took a moment to also um, kind of assess the other um, American Indian theme programs we've been involved in, including bringing a multi-tribal coalition together at Town Creek Indian Mound to think through a new exhibit there, partnering with Wakamasuan um, leadership to uh, acknowledge the crisis of murdered and missing indigenous women through a, a what we call a red dress exhibit that was on display at Brunswick Town Fort Anderson. Um, we also at Brunswick Town Fort Anderson have a staff uh, member named Jim McKee, who has been extremely active um, and, and really helpful to, uh, active with and helpful to the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor um, commission of which I am a member, and he's been working very closely with local uh, Gullah heritage practitioners there, particularly around mapping and research. Uh, you have uh, certainly received uh, further uh, additional details of our efforts. Uh, I shared a link, uh, Healing on the Land, which I consider to be the little sister of Singing on the Land. Um, this uh, money that funded this project came from the North Carolina Humanities Council CARES Act funds, which uh, originated from the NEH. Hopefully you had a chance to look at some of those videos. I think they've been powerful. Um, they also, you will know, talk about certainly um, epidemics and pandemics of the past, but it also talks about healing around um, cultural connections. And, um, and the ways in which certainly uh, during, the Civil War, during the Civil War, people um, had to face, you know, just unimaginable challenges and, but those challenges inspired great innovations in medicine. Um, I've already spoken about uh, the partnership at the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum, but we are also in the midst of working through our federal grants from the Department of Interior for two structures at that site, which I have to say is a priority for the division right now. Um, the Cary Stone Cottage, which some of you may recognize as the visitor center, has received some money um, through an ERA um, affiliated grant from Department of Interior, and then also the Tea House. Um, we are slow going. COVID has slowed things down, but we we haven't we have not slowed to a halt. But um, we continue to to push forward. I also mentioned that we faced some challenges around um, a weather related incident. Um, we know that um, tropical storm Fred impacted the West in really really catastrophic ways. Um, we know that it has thankfully um, been declared a disaster by FEMA. So all repairs that we are making at Vance Birthplace, which did um, lose uh, their uh, water supply, um, their, their infrastructure was impacted terribly. We still have not been able to find the leak there, but I think what we realized we're pivoting and we are realizing that instead of looking for a leak, it's time to replace um, you know, the, the piping there, uh, rather than continuously looking for a leak and, and just racking up bills, we're going to just replace the piping there so that we can um, move forward. Because right now they have porta potties out as well as a portable water source to be able to be open to the public. It's been extremely challenging for that staff. I want to shout out again Brunswick Town Fort Anderson. Um, they will be awarded um, the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association's Best Restored Shores Award for 2021 at the end of this month. According to this organization, quote, the award honors the best restored beaches in America annually. 
to help build awareness of the value of America's restored beaches. And uh, we're really excited for this recognition. The North Carolina Transportation Museum um, has, um, was very excited to host, um, to actually create and host the Life of a Brakeman, um, which opened at the end of last month to tell the story of an African-American um, brakeman and the worked very carefully with one of his descendants. Um, I, I continue to note to you all, and I can't emphasize this enough, I've never seen our staff so exhausted. I've never seen them so fatigued. Um, and yet they continue to move forward. We try to do what we can to support them and take things off their plates and put things on ours if need be. Um, we are in the midst of a division-wide strategic planning process. Um, we're continuing to grow, as I said, our true inclusion work. Um, and we're also working um, very closely with Sarah Coombs and Deputy Secretary Tracy Burns on a comprehensive evaluation around DEIA, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility narratives um, with the world-renowned Lord Cultural group, Resource Group. So we're very excited to be a part of that initiative. Um, my folks are my, my heroes and sheroes. They inspire me uh, every day to be innovative, to advocate for them, to fight for them. Um, and I just honestly can't imagine working with a stronger uh, group of people. They really, they really are amazing. And, and I hope that if you get a chance to stop by any of, our, any of our historic sites, I hope that you will thank them for all of their hard work. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and I would like to ask the commissioners if you have any questions or comments or observations to make. Um, please do so now regarding Ms. Um, Lanier's report before we move on. I have one question for uh, uh, Ms. Lanier. It's a short question. Uh, uh, Michelle, what is the exact size of your staff? Thank you, Commissioner Denard. When we are at our full complement, um, and this, I have to say, includes temporary employees, so it might not even be the best number to give you. We have a little less than 200 people when we include our temporary employees. Um, and in our in our appropriations are I think less than eight million. So we have, for twenty five historic sites, uh, I, I've been known to say we have a capacity crisis. Um, and one of the things I'm continuing to do is to work to raise funds, raise awareness, raise friends, attract new volunteers um, to help support the big work, particularly right now when people are focusing more and more, I'm sure Ken can relate, people are focusing more and more to seek answers from our historic resources to this very complex time that we're living through, not just the pandemic, but how, um, how intense the political climate is and the racial climate is. So our, our staff are being um, asked to juggle a lot because of the times that we're living in. And, and so that's a really important question that, that you're asking. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments or observations? Thank you so much, Ms. Lanier, for your report. And what I'd like to do now is to turn this over to our new Deputy Secretary of the Office of Archives and History before I close this out with my remarks. Dr. Waters, what do you have to say for us today? Right, Dr. Johnson, thank you so much. And, and I'm going to be brief because you've heard a lot from a remarkable group of people. And I am so privileged and honored to have the opportunity to see that from this vantage point. Um, I could really just echo here what Sarah had to say uh, about how remarkable this team is and how kind and welcoming they have all been to me as, um, as I've joined the team. But one person that Sarah did not talk about was herself. And so let me just say, um, a big piece of this remarkable team is Sarah Kuntz and Sarah's uh, leadership in, in leading the, the office 
over what nearly a year has been uh, tremendous and I think has been um, has been something that has been great that all of us are very grateful for. So if we were together, I would say, let's just stand and give her a round of applause. But since we're not, I know that you will be doing that. Sarah has been so gracious to me uh, to help me transition into this role. And I just wanna thank her here uh, on the record for that. She continues to work with me um, on things. I keep going to her with many questions. She understands that I'll probably continue to do that. Um, she's been patient, even patient yesterday when we went to lunch and I had to go take my menu back. I was trying to accession the menu, I guess, Sarah, for my own collection. But um, Sarah has been so patient in answering my questions. I've been grateful to have the opportunity too to talk to most of you all one on one. I didn't get a chance to talk to everyone, but I had great conversations with you all. I am deeply honored about the fact that I will continue to have the opportunity to work with each one of you. And Dr. Johnson, I'll say it was very strange not to participate in votes. So I was sitting on my hands and I don't, I don't want Phil to come in and tell me, no, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> so another person I wanna to thank too is Parker, uh, Parker Backstrom. Parker has really made uh, it very comfortable and a smooth transition for me here. Parker is just a wealth of knowledge. And so without him, I don't think that this would have been as smooth uh, an entry into this role as it has been. So Parker, I wanted to take the time to publicly thank you as well. Mm -hmm. And to each member of the team, um, and I, I'm sure that Ramona would echo this. I think one of the things that we all know that in graduate school, you'll learn to, uh, those of us who are academics are taught to ask good questions. And I am just uh, full of questions. So my, I'll just say my first meeting with Ramona and her team, just to find out all of the things that are going in, in historical resources, I think I was just absolutely amazed. And so uh, Ramona had mapped out that conversation, but it went off the rails really fast because I was so full of questions. So she has, she's kindly you know, setting up meetings for me to continue to go through that process. And I deeply appreciate that. There are four things I would just highlight in, in my comments here um, to say that I've had an opportunity to visit with the staff down at the Maritime Museum in Southport. Ken knows that I was on vacation just before entering this role, was visiting Southport, decided to stop in and see the staff there. And I, all I can say, Ken, is wow, this, this is a deeply committed group of people who are working on the front lines. It was an enjoyable visit. They took the time to just walk me through the many things that they're doing there. And I would say again to what Michelle said, if, if you do visit, you know, thank them for the work that they're doing. So that was one uh, major highlight that I've had so far. Another is that I had the opportunity to visit with the staff at the Capitol with Michelle and to hear the stories about how they are answering some of the hard questions and to hear about their experiences of being in that space, especially during the protests last year and how they experienced that for me was a, long, a learning lesson. And I deeply appreciated that. It made me wonder as Michelle knows about self-care and what they're doing for self-care to care for themselves. So I think that if you're there and visiting all of these sites and thank them for the work that they're doing, that they will be deeply appreciative of, of that. Another highlight has been, as Ramona said, going out yesterday and being able to work with the archaeology team. What I was thankful that as after after I had an opportunity to actually to push the the, um, the machine that they didn't tell me, like my father used to say to me, "You did that wrong, and I'm gonna have to go back and do it over again." So they were so kind to tell me that I did okay, but it was just so much fun. And I just see so many opportunities of ways that we can engage younger students to get them interested in the work that goes on in these fields. So I'm, I'm deeply uh, appreciate the opportunity. I'll have the, the chance to work with Ramona and this entire team to kind of take that message to, to the people of the state of North Carolina. And I'll also will be for the rest of this week traveling with Secretary Wilson, going out to the Outer Banks to visit the graveyard of the, of, of the uh, uh, you know, the, the museum there. And so I'm looking forward to that. So I'll be traveling for the rest of this week to visit staff out on the coast. But again, I just wanna say and not take up too much more time here, Dr. Johnson, that I'm deeply appreciative of this opportunity. I'm excited about it. I was told by uh, Dr. Crow 
that you're going to drink from a fire hose when you enter the job. So uh, just know that. And I have been drinking from the fire hose, but I remain enthusiastic about, about this opportunity. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Thank you for, to this entire team and to this entire uh, group of people. Ken, your, your folks there, Michelle, Ramona, and, and Sarah, thank you all for all that you do. Thank you all as commissioners for the support that you give us. And I look forward to continuing to work with you as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're going off script just a tiny bit because um, I really would, first of all, like to offer our appreciation, Ms. Coop, Sarah, for the work that you've done in stepping into a position and to remind everyone you were doing two jobs at one time, two full-time jobs, and listening to your report, just the highlights, um, punctuated for me the um, deep work that you've been doing. And so I wanted to, on the record, give you my own appreciation and thank you as Commissioner Valerie Ann Johnson, but also to ask my fellow commissioners if they have any remarks that they would like to say to Ms. Coop at this time, you are free to unmute yourself and to do so. Dr. Johnson, this is Barbara Snowden. I would just like to say to Sarah, thank you for a very good job. I know it was a very difficult time and we really appreciate her work. Thank you. Certainly have a clearer calendar these days, <laughs> a little slightly clearer calendar. You're very welcome. I'm, I was very happy to do it. It was my honor and like I said, great group couldn't have been easier to work with. So happy to do it. Commissioner Phillips. I just, I think I'm unmuted. I, I, I This is Susan Phillips. I just want to say I, that, that I just think that your, um, your work ethic is just astounding and your ability to accomplish tasks in a tight, um, economic environment and in a difficult political environment is, is, was just extraordinary. Thank you very much. Uh, David Denar, I would also like to uh, 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 say thanks to, uh, to Sarah uh, for uh, keeping the uh, vehicle in the road, uh, navigating in excellent fashion. Uh, we appreciate all that uh, uh, that you've been doing and all that you will do in the future. And also, I want to uh, uh, welcome uh, with open arms our, our new leader, uh, uh, Dr. Waters. And uh, 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 I hope that uh, you, too, will be able to keep this vehicle in the road. Uh, we have a few potholes here and there, uh, but I'm sure you are an excellent driver and you will do well. Okay, uh, again, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. Do I have any other commissioners who want to step in and say something at this time? Well, thank you. And I do have um, to say thank you to all the division directors, y'all are keeping us on the road as well. And so thinking about all the work that you've done over this time of pandemic, it's astonishing and it is important work and I'm glad that you are staying the course. And as Ramona Bartos has pointed out to us, we have a few climate change challenges. Um, we may not get as, we may not have an increase in storms, but the intensity will increase so I thank you all, all of you, Ken Howard, Sarah Cruz, Michelle Lanier, and Ramon Bartos for being good stewards of the precious resources that we have. But um, Dr. Waters, you have a wonderful team, as you know, and I know that you will do fine. 
there are a couple of just reminders that I have. Well, one, one thing I'd like to say is um, forgiveness that um, Dave Ruffin, and he will be back with us next meeting. The North Carolina Maritime Council will be having its annual meetings down in Southport. So if you want an opportunity to experience the wonderful museum there and to get a feel for another part if you don't already live there, part of snow, um, please try to think about that. The meeting is in November, the fourth through the sixth. And commissioners, do you all have any other announcements that should be made in this public forum before we um, move to adjournment? Uh, one last question. Is there any thought being given to the idea of when we may resume our in-person meetings? To my knowledge. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> That's something. But when we, we hope to be back together, I know it will be great. But until then, thank you, Parker and Nat for keeping us um, on task and getting us in this virtual world and to Bill Fagan for <laughs> keeping me straight and <laughs> allowing me to um, serve in this um, temporary capacity. Dr. Johnson, if I may. Yes. Just course. a remind a reminder that the next meeting of the commission will take place on December 8th, as was decided uh, early in the year. So that will be the last regularly scheduled meeting. That's not to say that there might not be a special meeting called in between now and then, but that will be our next official, uh, your next official regular meeting, December 8th, which is a, I believe, I think these are all Wednesdays. That is a Wednesday, yes. And at the same time, correct? Two o'clock, that's correct. And I will send you the requisite notifications in advance, just keep people uh, on track and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. So any other questions, comments, or concerns that you have before um, I call for adjournment? Well, at this point, I, um, I can move that we adjourn, or I can ask someone to please officially um, move for us to adjourn. Dr. Johnson, I make a motion we adjourn. <laughs> and I will second that. And that was seconded by David Denard, moved by uh, Barbara Snowden. And I don't believe we need to do a roll call for this one, do we? <laughs> I think you're okay. So I adjourn our meeting. And thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.